Hello class. So today's lecture is going to be a continuation from where we left off in the Surging Seas Risk Map and moving into Refugees and Migration. And this topic is quite big. Uh, it's going to take about two lectures to really get through it. And this first one is more of an introduction. The following has graphic material that may be uncomfortable. So just as a warning, um, in parts of the video will be graphic in nature due to the video, the photographs and videos that I'm going to be displaying for you, which talk about refugees and the way we think about them. And I think it's important that we cover this and we talk about it because as civic activists and civic media professionals, it's important to understand these topics as a larger structure, something that's bigger than all of us. However, we have to personalize it into more of a person-to-person -person experience so we understand refugees as people rather than as a, as a group or a statistic. So this is gonna be fully uh, diagnosed during this lecture. So first, um, I want to first uh, say that your responses were excellent. As a group, you have an extremely good idea of how to uh, diagnose and analyze some of the things that we've been going over thus far. And I've been giving you a fair amount of disparate texts that are loosely linked, and you'll see how they all connect as we go through the course. But I'm seeing that you're very much understanding how things should be read and should be talked about. So I really appreciate that. The reason why I gave you the Surging Seas risk map is to think about how refugees might be more localized, what it might seem to have to migrate at a certain point in your community, because the only way that we're gonna be civic media actors or civic actors or use civic good is to understand things on a community-based level and then stretch those out by empathizing with those who are more vulnerable than us. And I really appreciated seeing that in many of your responses, that you notice that there are people more vulnerable than you that you would be in a more of a danger than yourselves. So the first thing I want to bring up is the, the term that we'll be using and a reading that you'll be doing tonight. Uh, the ter we'll be talking about slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor. And that's a book by Rob Nixon in 2011. And that text is a book about what it means to understand climate change as violence or the idea of refugees and migration as violence. And it's termed slow violence because it affects us slowly. But we have to consider what is violence? When we think of violence in our mind, we think of something instantaneous or tragic or something shocking. Violence is something that takes place over any period of time that affects a person in a disastrous way. And so if you were to be in a flood zone, uh, like in the movies, Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is highly recommended, uh, though not required in this class, it is one of the recommended texts. The people who live in like the bayou areas of Southern Louisiana or are affected by something known as slow violence because they, over time, will be hurt by the rising seas that arrive around them. But the more poor you are, the less mobility you have. And what I always make a reference to is density, population density and privilege. The majority of you live on Long Island, and so when we think about Long Island, we never really think about its population density. But if we were to take the same map scale and look at a section of town like Island Park, and so zooming in on that little island, Island Park has approximately 10,000 human beings on it. And you can see the scale of density. The little island is an island beneath Long Island and is surrounded by water on all sides and is approximately four feet above sea level at its street level, which means Sandy, of course, affected it, but as will rising seas. And what we also notice is how many people, 10,000 people live in this. If we were to look at the same scale, leaving anywhere within 100 miles of any coast, you'll see that the disparity or the density has reduced almost down to nothing. If you were to just jump to any part of the middle of the country, like the upper right corner of Oklahoma, you'll see that in the same scale, there's barely anybody that lives there. So when we talk about where people go and where people have to move to, we notice that the more vulnerable you are, the more likely it is that you are unable to move. We have the privilege of mobility for the most of us. Some of us have none whatsoever. And when we think about that, we think about the the structural disadvantages that some people have. We don't really ever get to think about how structurally problematic things are. And we, as we get into race later on in the semester, we'll talk about how that is part of the systemic problems that we've had as a country and as a people. For an example, what I mean by vulnerability is we often don't think about how much extended trouble we could get in. If you were somebody who could not afford a parking ticket and you parked illegally, accidentally, let's just say, that parking ticket you couldn't afford to pay becomes another parking ticket and then eventually becomes a bench warrant and then eventually a jail time and then eventually bond and then eventually literal prison imprisonment just because you couldn't pay to begin with because the money starts doubling up. That's a vulnerability. 
And that vulnerability is something that we as people have to start thinking about. So what we're gonna do in this one is I'm gonna give you a briefer about how refugees and migration is a bigger issue than anything. And we're not even, and we're thinking about it only in terms of refugees and migration. And we're usually only thinking as people about refugees from war torn areas. But that article where you read about Isaiah and his strife in South America and moving north and crossing the Texas border because of climate change is more likely going to be affecting people as we move forward. There's a very large belief that the Syrian civil war, the one that created ISIS, is as a result of, of droughts due to climate change. So we can see how just climate change itself can be offsetting. Once the droughts occurred, there was no way of getting food, so dark markets started appearing. And once black markets appear, the idea of marketplaces appear. And then mobs appear, bosses, leadership, and, their, and so forth until an Islamic state becomes the leader of an area. And that becomes the, the ISIS that we know of, the one that we're currently fighting. But a lot of this is about um, interpersonal and inter intergovernmental issues that we don't really think about on any type of way. We don't really ever consider what it means to think about borderlands when we're, we live in this country. We're very privileged to live in the United States and a lot of what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't have to think about borders. We don't have to think about bombs. We don't have to think about trouble. We do have to think about school shootings. We haven't been, that's a fairly recent problem the United States has had where we have to literally physically start planning on that. That's an error and, and a problem of a homeland that was never really built into our system. In other countries, strife occurs at the borderlands of all things. Borderlands occur due to nationalism. And Benedict Anderson in the book Imagine Communities describes nationalism as the pride for your country. Not a willingness to stand up and be patriotic, but a willingness to die for the nation. That's a willingness to sacrifice yourself for the better of the nation. But then we have to ask a question of where do nations come from? Where do borders come from? In the past, it would come from wherever the community could extend its reach farthest. When print materials appeared, this is based on Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, language itself became the border. You would protect that language at all costs. Now, newspapers are a sign of privilege. When you type a newspaper in Italian, let's say, it eliminates people who spoke Neapolitan or wrote Neapolitan. And once you only print in Italian, you stop funding newspapers that featured smaller communities like N Naples people. And Neapolitan becomes now a spoken language, barely written. And that means the borders of Italy are based on not just the fact that you speak Italian, but where you can get Italian newspapers. So the borders of France and Germany and Austria right there become borders not just because of their, their lines that have been drawn, but because the nationality themselves is based on the language that defends itself. Then we have to think about why people have to leave lands in the first place. Sometimes there are places without borders, Palestine or Kurd, where the Kurds live, for example. The big issue that we've been talking about, or yesterday that was big news, is the idea to leave the Kurds to themselves in the, in the upper part of Syria. The Kurds don't have, the Kurdish people do not have a land. They, are, they were, were attempted to create a land from Syria called Kurdistan, but it never formulated. And now the Kurds who had fought alongside the United States army for years, seemingly being abandoned, and Turkey sees the Kurds as enemies, as terrorists, similar to ISIS. The Kurds are a, a people that have sacrificed a lot to keep ISIS down and, and keep the United States safe, but they don't have an actual land. So they are a people that have to have a space and being having land or having a house is a privilege. We don't really ever think of it because we go home to our houses or we have the opportunity to go home to those houses. So where do refugees come from? Where does this occur? And so one of the most, one of the examples I'm gonna to use today is Syria. And so I'm gonna talk about two examples and there is graphic content coming up. When we think about migration, we never really think about the people. In 2014, a photograph taken by Massimo Sestini of the Mare Nostrum project, an Italian project that was mapping um, migrants coming onto the shore, took a photo of Mare Nostrum, a large ship with hundreds of migrants on it. And the photograph was phenomenal. And he started a project called Tag Yourself, which is kind of like find yourself inside of these photos. Where are you? Are you, uh, are you on this boat? The problem with the photo is that it clumps together groups of migrants as one. They don't really think about uh, people. They think of them as statistics, where migrants are people that were forced out of their land. In this case, they were coming from parts of Africa that were destabilized. Jad Melky once said that you have to think about the Mediterranean as a lake. And if you were to have a lake house or know of somebody with a lake house, you kind of have to be somewhat neighborly with the people who live on the lake. 
The Mediterranean is kind of like that, except at a large global scale. On the easternmost end, you have the basis of the Middle East. On the westernmost end, you have uh, France, Spain, Portugal, and Northern Africa. And we don't really think about what it means to have Egypt and Italy sharing a body of water. So when people are destabilized in Northern Africa or the, middle, the western part of middle, the Middle East, they're going to go to the places that are closest via the water. Now, we don't often think about how this even happens. The Mare Nostrum is a photograph of people, but what you may not see is there's no pilot. That's because it's illegal to ship migrants or move people or human traffic. And so oftentimes, the pilots themselves will abandon the ship and you will see the boats move in without people. And so it requires a large rescue effort for people to move and become part of that new land. Now, by contrast, I'm going to show you a photograph of Island Curdy. He drowned in September 2015 when his similar ship to the Mare Nostrum. He's a Syrian boy who, with his father, was on a boat and the pilot of the ship left in rough seas and the boat overturned, spilling out most of the refugees onto the water. Island washed up on shore. He drowned by not having any care for who he was as a person. He had been dehumanized. He had been treated as an object, as a person who was not only abandoned from his own land, but now abandoned from the people who tried to save him. A Turkish man finds him and picks him up off the beach in his dead, lifeless body. And now we start thinking or start empathizing with the idea of life lost because now it's been singularized down to one small boy. That type of thought or that type of process brings us the idea of empathy, that it, it could be just like the tomb of the unknown soldier, it could be somebody related to you, it could be somebody you know personally. And these things allow us to start thinking about humans rather than statistics. The following is a video of Amran Deknish, and Amran Deknish shows first-person view of what it's like to be rescued from a bombing. The young boy, born in 2011, lived in a house in Aleppo. The city is no longer there. Aleppo was a, a thriving city and it's now ru ru literally rubbles thanks to the Syrian civil war. In this video, Amran Deknish's family was bombed. His house was literally bombed, and he was brought to an ambulance outside. And in the video, you're going to see um, Amran Deknish white blood off his face. This is a uh, somewhat graphic. He does not die, but it's a graphic video. Wiping the blood from his face. Five-year-old Umran Deknish trying to work out what has happened. Another casualty of the war in Syria. He was pulled from the rubble in Aleppo after his home was targeted by airstrikes. Somehow he survived, but at what cost? His hair matted with the dust from his home, his face caked in his own blood. He's left alone in the ambulance. There's no one to hold his hand here, and he doesn't even cry. He just pats his little face, brushing his blood next to him. At least three people were killed last night in the attack on the rebel-held neighborhood in the east of the city. Several others were badly injured. This, though, the face of a boy who is supposedly one of the lucky ones. The most important part of this video, I think, is Amran's visual expression when he realizes his embarrassment about bleeding on the chair. And I think this is one of the saddest moments in the entire film. If you get a chance, go back and look at it again and watch the video when Amran realizes that he's made the chair dirty. He's not so worried about the blood gushing from his head, but the fact that he dirtied his, the people who are helping him space. And that humility, that, that humbleness of a child is so strange to understand that the boy is literally shell-shocked. He is gray by rubble matter and bombing. And yet he's more concerned about the people's material around him. And we never really think about that. We never think about the most vulnerable around us are so think, thinking in this way of like just pure scared emotional feelings. The difference between empathy and sympathy is this. We can't really sympathize with Amran Deknish. We can't feel what it feels like to be bombed. We don't know how to say something to the effect of, oh, that's too bad, I'm that sorry. We don't wake up every day and hear whistling noises of bombs flying through the air. We go to work with the most problems that we're gonna hit road rage on the southern state but we don't really think about the idea of just the possibility of instantaneous death by, by bombing. Amran probably lived with that feeling. He probably knew it was there. But we can empathize with it. We can understand that he is another human being that needs help. He has no more land. 
Aleppo is gone. There is no other places to go for him to live in. So he left. He's now moving on as a, a to be to migrate, to be a refugee, to hope to seek asylum, to find some other new land to be. But his idea of nationalism doesn't exist. It can't, it can no longer exist. He has to be helped by the other people. And this brings us to our most important part of this class, which is civic media, which is the projects that you do in this class. Several of you have asked about how to make these vlogs. What vlogs are we doing in this class? What are the projects and why do we do it? As I think I've told you, I can't remember anymore. There's so many lectures in. Um, I, my background is media literacy and civic media. And civic media is using digital tools to use it to express our voices. As Eric Gordon and Paul Mealitis define civic media, it is the technologies, designs, and practices that produce and reproduce the sense of being in the world with others toward a common good. I really love that definition of civic media because it is the idea of being with the others, being with other people. Its idea is to combat xenophobia. Xenophobia is the fear of the other, the other. That means the people that aren't you, but it isn't just others like friends or people that you don't really know. The other is the idea of the unknown and to understand them as the other dehumanizes them. And in the dehumanizing process, it's extremely violent because in dehumanizing, we treat them like objects. And once you've dehumanized one human, it isn't that hard to dehumanize many. And that is the problem with xenophobia, is that we group together the other as a group of people that we don't have to think about. Civic media combats that by using the tools that you have at your access. I'm simply using my iPhone here. I will simply use YouTube to upload this video. However, what I can say in this video and what I can express is part of civic media, that I could use these tools to inform others about things that are going on. I could use these tools to express my, my expertise on these subjects. So one of the things that you have to do for your vlogs is similar to that. So you've been tasked with two different vlogs to begin with, and they have to be around three and a half minutes long. There is a rubric on them, and the idea is that you act as the expert to an audience of potentially hundreds of thousands of people. Is it, are you likely to get that many views? I have no idea. I hope you do. But you have to consider that YouTube is a platform that may give you that many views. So you have to act as the expert. And your goal then is to articulate your point to do as, as similar to what I've done, which is make sure you quote and reference material that is official and val verified information that goes across, and also that it informs the user, that it informs people of to what you're actually speaking about, that what you're talking about is verifiably factual. It isn't just opinion. You are allowed to editorialize. That means add your opinion. I would definitely recommend you look at this through your perspective. Part of being a civic media professional is understanding that you bring your mind to this world as well and that your expertise and knowledge in this is, should never be discounted by something else. And so you have to use a, a, a cell phone. You don't have to appear on camera. You could actually appear as slides. You could appear as a puppet for if that's your character you'd like to do. But what you really need to do is be articulate and fact-based and support a lot of what you say with evidence, which is articles and so forth. And for the piece, if you happen to attend uh, the Extinction Rebellion event uh, during the Climate Change Week or Climate Awareness Week, if you happen to attend that event, you can merge the global change and the protest research piece into one. For that, I recommend you make a five minute clip because it should be a little bit longer to explain it. In that one too, you should have at least a photograph or a bite, a sound bite, of a protester explaining the ethnographic value of why they're using their First Amendment rights and do they feel like protest is part of uh, it should be used as a right. For the global change one, you're looking for an issue or a topic that's not really spoken about on the news. And as I talked to you about uh, before, that I have a criticism of the mainstream media that we'll talk about later in the semester when we talk about criticality, that the mainstream media is always seeking to find the best thing for ratings rather than for global good. And when they do ratings, it means that they're really going for the spectacular. They're looking for things that are going to get people watching which means they don't really report on doom and gloom. They don't report on things like refugee crisis, migration, or climate change, because it makes people realize their own mortality or their own possibility of having to deal with another. And so in doing so, they focus on tweets or they focus on things that really make them feel like they're bringing people's attention to the screen rather than talking about civic values. It's always been that way. There hasn't been a change in media. If you watch Good Night and Good Luck, Edward R. Murrow, literally fights against this concept during the McCarthy era of the 1950s. 
his big criticism of the executive producers was, couldn't we do the right thing? And they said, but by doing the right thing, it would cause people to tune out. People don't want a civic lesson when they want television, they want entertainment, said, Edward, said Paley, potentially paraphrased in the film. While I don't think that's fully true and that's reductionist of all types, I do think that we have to seek other outlets in order to experience things that would be more fulfilling to us. That also leads us to a problem of the algorithm, which we haven't gotten anywhere near yet, which is sometimes the news that we seek leads us to the news that we are not seeking because the algorithm has replaced the idea of time spent, the idea of focusing on the screen too long. And that's something we'll get to in a few. But for this one, I want you to think about refugees and migrants. So for homework, you're going to be reading an essay uh, by Rob Nixon, which is in the Chronicle of Higher Education of All Things. It's right when his book came out. It's kind of a synthesis of slow violence and the environmentalism of the poor. And then for homework, very short, you're going to write a very short, I don't want to call it a lesson plan, but a, a guide to understanding refugees. You're going to use the Google. Uh, you're going to use the library if it's your thing. And you're going to put together five sources that kind of give a, the reader or the uh, a friend or somebody, a primer on how to understand refugees. This is going to take some very savvy reading and understanding in order to do it. You do not have to uh, write an essay of this, but it just make an annotated bibliography. And for those of you who've never made an annotated bibliography, it's just a list of links with a short uh, synthesized description underneath each of them. And that's all you really have to do. As we get closer to midterm, I'm going to be putting up the deadlines on two of the vlogs, the global change, global change and the protest research. And this way we could get those two in and we could share them with our classmates. So I hope this was fulfilling. The next lecture is going to talk more about what it means to understand climate refugees and what it means to understand refugees in a more localized space. Until next time.